I think it's already. My name's Patrick Hammond. You can catch me there on Twitter, at Patrick Hammond. I'm always up for a rant about performance or chat, and come and grab me in the pub afterwards. If you're not on Twitter or anything, um, please, please talk. It's good to talk. Um, you haven't guessed it already, I live and work here in London at the Financial Times. We are the world's leading news organisation for business and economic affairs, where, amongst other things, I'm helping to rebuild the next generation of FT.com. We're redefining how the FT delivers news, creating an immersive and personalised news experience um, for our users. But one of the core remits when we've been building this product is that we, know we wanted to make it extremely fast. We've done a lot of research and know that Speed correlates directly with engagement of our users and therefore people coming back to our site, reading new, uh, more news, subscribing more, giving us more money and paying my wages. Um, but I'm not actually here today to talk about the product development of that. Um, I'd love to be able to talk to that, but I'm here to talk to you about how we're making it as fast as possible and more specifically, one of the underlying technologies that we're using to deliver the news as fast as possible. So hopefully this may uh, look are slightly familiar to many of you in the room, especially if you're a developer. Since their inception, web pages have been delivered over the same way, over the network, over the same way for tens and tens of years. We have TCP IP at the bottom, HTTP at the top, and we use the transfer protocol to deliver our HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that form the web pages that you build on a daily basis and your users interact with. And as application designers and developers, we've rarely had to understand even how the bottom half of this stack fits together and how it communicates with the top layer. Um, and by and large, that's remained the same for about 20 years now. Um, but this is beginning to change. And it's quite an exciting time because of that. And that's, again, what I'm here to talk to you today. For the first time in nearly over 20 years, we now have a new version of the underlying transfer protocol of the internet, um, the protocol that all of our websites use to, to deliver their assets. And, the simplicity, I think, of the HTTP protocol has, has the reason why it's been so long, right? It was actually from its initial design, from Tins Berners-Lee and his colleagues at CERN, such a well-designed specification that it didn't really need to change that much. It's actually lasted us so well. We now have fridges, watches, even cars that communicate with each other and the servers around the world using this transfer protocol. You might find that a bit scary that cars are talking to each other over HTTP, but I think it's an amazing testament to, um, to the protocol and why it's actually survived so long. But as uh, things get older, you know, most things start to sign, show some signs of stress. And to meet these new challenges, the web of 1991 is very different to the web of 2016. And so to meet these new challenges, it's starting to show some signs of stress. And so that's why in 2012, the HTTP Biz, which is a working group part of the IETF, um, announced the new initiative to create HTTP2. It's taken until now, until last year, for that working draft to come out and be finalized. And that's why it's exciting. Literally last year, we have a new uh, point two version of the um, underlying transfer protocol of the internet. And this is very much off the back of the work that Mike Bleachy and colleagues at Google did in the speedy draft. Might talk about a little bit about that later if I have time. So that's what I'm going to cover today, is the why, the what, the where, and the when. Why do you need to know about HTTP? How does it work underneath? And what, why you should know about that to help you with your daily basis. But most of you are probably asking, and I definitely ask myself this as well, um, why do we, did we need a new version, right? I'm still building websites every single day, delivering them, they're working, our users loving them, coming back. Why do we need this? And it's quite common and quite right for you to ask that, but I have to let you into a little secret that we're all trapped in this lulled sense of uh, false security that our websites are, in fact, using the network extremely inefficiently. And why is this? Hopefully, the next section is going to explain that. I mentioned earlier that the web of 95, this is ft.com taken in 95, is very different to the web of today. Our users are expecting a much more immersive experience. Hundreds of resources, different mediums, images, video, interactions. But all of this is coming at a cost when we deliver it down the network to our users. As you can see, it's very, very different. Uh, that is literally just text on a white. They didn't have CSS then. This is all just tables. And it was probably one single file, probably two at most. 
Um, it's completely different to what our users are expecting. We have to hire hundreds of people to be able to deliver this now and live up with the rest of the um, comp competition that we have in the world. And so our average web pages are now making over 80 requests per page. And that is just, that's not it. That's the 95th percentile is more like 300 plus. We are at the peak of a website obesity crisis and the trend as you can see here is not stopping anytime soon. Let me just let that settle in. 80 requests. HTTP 1 and 1.1 simply was not designed to cater for the sheer amount of requests going down the pipe like this. It's probably just one or five. The first website that Tim Berners-Lee ever made was a single document and it was linking to another one. That was it. Just one request. So whilst we've seen a great increase in the available bandwidth that people have over the last few years, a lot of us here, we're very privileged to live in London. We have things like Virgin Media that have cable going into our houses that have now something ridiculous like 200 megabits a second pipe going into your own living room. Yet we haven't seen the same benefits and improvements in latency. Now, what is latency? So latency is essentially can be boiled down to the time it takes from a request to go from your mobile phone all the way to the server and back again, the round trip time. And mobile networks, by their pure nature, are very highly latent things. You are, it's mobile, it's in the name, right? You are mobile, you're walking around, it's going to take a long time. And when Google were building, uh, were, were experimenting with Speedy, Mike Bleachy, and it's a great article down here, the slides will be online later, they found that whilst you increased the speed of bandwidth, it plateaued, there was a threshold where that had no, no longer had any more impact on your page load time, whereas, there was, for every 20 millisecond improvement in latency, there was a near linear improvement with the page load time of your website. And there are many good reasons for this. You know, as we've seen, it's 80 requests. The average page is composed of many small resources, which require many connections, many TCP connections, each with their own overhead. And the performance of each one of this is very, very closely tied to your round trip time. HTTP 1, the data was defined as an ASCII character um, stream of text. So you can actually see it. It's just, uh, it's English, and it's the text that you can go by, it's ASCII. So to, because of this, we must send and receive the requests in exactly the same order that we sent them. So we have to, when we send a request for image one, we have to wait for the server to respond with that data so we can allocate the data to that request in the browser until we can send the next one on a single TCP connection. And this phenomenon is known as head of line blocking. This could be an uh, analogy like this, is that you could be in a bank, you have two people in front of you uh, waiting for the cashier, you are blocked by them and however long it may take to process them at the cashier until you can go. And we have exactly the same problem with TCP connections. Because the data is ASCII, we can't interleave it because the things might get mixed up, the cashier might get confused, so we have to wait for that response before we can send the next response. Now this is a fundamental flaw well, some would say, in the design of HTTP 1, and most importantly, why we have a ripple of effects. So to get around this issue, browsers started to um, open more than one TCP connection for the same host. It's like, okay, I can't, I, I can't send another request in this TCP connection, so I'm gonna have to open another one. So we started off by opening two. And then that wasn't enough, so now the specification says that we're allowed to have six open TCP connections to the same host uh, name. To, to overcome the head-of-line blocking. But this comes at a great cost to our users, right? Each connection incurs a full TCP handshake. If you've ever seen me talk before, I've explained in depth about that, but on your UK average 3G connection, that could be up to 1,000 milliseconds just to open the TCP connection. And the connection, then we, if you're over a secure network, that means the TLS handshake as well. And then each com connection competes with the underlying network resources, that bandwidth, um, and thus causing potential congestion on the underlying network link. And that wasn't enough, right? So we stopped at six, we we're like, no, but I need, I need to optimize this as much as possible. So we started to create hacks and anti-patterns to overcome head of line blocking. So one of which is concatenation. I've heard all the cool kids today like to use React, Angular, jQuery, Bootstrap, and Mootools all in the same application. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Seb just told me about my dear friend, Ollie, is actually using an architect like that at the moment. He's no longer my friend. Um, <laughs> and so 
why create t I have the overhead of creating five connections when I can con con concatenate that into a single file, and therefore I only need to open one TCP connection for this. And this is great, and I still do this to a daily basis. Most of you will have build processes that are concatenating these files together. But this comes at a cost, right? That's more CPU and memory overhead for your low-powered mobile device to download and parse all that, even if they only need to actually execute two lines of Mootles. You've just inf incurred the user from downloading all of those bytes. And if I change a single line, even let's add a semicolon to a line, and then invalidating all of those bytes, even though I only change one byte in that file, I'm forcing the, down the user to download. Images actually came first before this, and images were the main reason why we actually started opening more um, connections, because in kind of the early noughties, they were the main medium that we were throwing loads more at. And so we started to borrow ideas from gaming developers in the 80s, and we started to sprite image together. So rather than having a 200 HTTP requests over um, probably six um, TCP connections, I can concatenate that into one, sprite into one. But the problem here is I probably only need to use one image on my page. And so I've just forced the user to download 200 pixels, maybe even two megabytes of data, when all I wanted to do was display that one image. And again, the invalidation problems here is I change, my designer decides that this devil actually needs to be green. We just force the user to re-download all of those images, not benefiting of having a cache at all on the user's device. And then we decided that six hosts wasn't even enough. Right? And so we started to shard our TCP connections. So here, this is literally taken from Flickr a month ago. This is C1, C2, C3, C4 at staticflickrhost.com. This is actually all residing back to probably the same IP address or the same server even. And this is called domain sharding. So this is tricking the browser to thinking that these images are actually on different hosts. So it will open up another six connections. So Flickr has probably actually got 24 open TCP connections right now. And this is coming at a cost. Um, by creating those additional TCP connections, we're actually f uh, completely flooding the underlying TC uh, network. And Etsy, I should have had a link to them. Etsy have done some amazing research here as to the threshold point at which you actually start to um, cause um, performance issues rather than gain them by t domain sharding. And finally, we started to realize that actually, let's not create a TCP connection at all and uh, let's inline that resource into our document. So we can send it down in the initial one. And it's quite ironic because I've sat in this exact place um, talking about why this is such a great idea probably about two years ago and has been uh, an evangelist of this. And I'm now realizing that it, it's probably a very bad idea. Um, <laughs> Because when you base 64 encode an image, for instance, you're actually increasing the size of that image by 33%. So you're actually forcing the user to download more. And again, low-powered devices are going to have a very hard time and lots of memory is going to be consumed to convert this back to its native format. Hopefully, you've learned um, why latency matters. It's all about latency. Where latency occurs, what head of line blocking is, the fun most fundamental problem of H1, and the hacks and anti-patterns that we created because of head-of-line blocking. So now that we know that, how can, let's have a look at H2 to see how it's overcome these problems and what specific bits of the design of the specification have, have made it so brilliant. And so to start with, I thought this is quite good. This is um, taken from a great book, it's very simple, it's an online free open source book called H2 Explained by Daniel Stenberg. He is the, um, one of the maintainers of Curl, and he works uh, um, at networking team at Mozilla. And he was um, explained the problems or the manifest, um, essentially, that the HTBiz ha working group had, the remits and the requirements that they had when they were building the specification. And that was obviously to be less sensitive to latency, fix the pipelining and head of line blocking problems that we just saw, eliminate the need to increase the number of connections and the, all those anti-patterns to each host. And this is really important to keep all existing interfaces, URI formats, and schemes. I can't stress this enough. When we're designing a new version of the spec, it would have been great to say, okay, you know those um, uh, periods inside URLs, like www.ft.com? I don't like them. I want to turn that into like a tilde, www tilde ft. We would have broken the internet, right? So we can't change the scheme, the semantics, the methods that we use so that most RESTful APIs talk to each other. We couldn't change. 
And most importantly, it had to be made within the IETF's HSPIRS working group. Google laid some amazing foundations with the speedy research, but it was for them and it was in a controlled environment. We wanted, like most good um, web specifications, to be developed in the open and let other people um, add to and ultimately make it better. So to do this, they've outlined what I think are the six core features that make up H2, which is multiplexing, a binary data framing format, prioritization, header compression, flow control, and server push. And for uh, this, because this is front end London, for front end developers, I think the most important things to understand are multiplexing, prioritization, and server resource pushing. At the heart of all of H2 are streams. Streams are essentially a virtual channel within inside the TCP connection um, that all ca um, which carry bi directional messages. So the streams are virtual, they don't really exist. They can contain messages, which are complete sequences of frames. And messages are the things that most closely map to a HTTP 1 request or response. And then you have frames, the building blocks of it all. Frames are the data payloads, and they're binary. And so we have frames. Frames make up messages. Messages are transformed within streams. And um, a connection can have multiple streams. As I said, this is the building block, um, which is a frame. Each frame has a type such as I am a header frame, or I am a data frame, or I am a push frame. All frames share a common nine byte header field, which is this. So regardless of the frame type, they'll all have this same header field. And the header field is really important because it declares its type, obviously, saying I'm a data frame. Its length in bytes, because remember I said it's a binary format. And um, the stream it belongs to, so a stream identifier, and maybe its priority, which lives inside the flags. Um, and so the data within the frame is actually represented uh, as binary. And, and this is really important because it, it allows a, a frame to declare its length, say, I am uh, 20 bytes long. And this is the reason why we no longer have to open TCP, more TCP connections, because that means that I can interleave frames on the same connection. If the, cloud, the client, say the browser, is consuming that connection and it doesn't care about, say, stream four, it looks at the length of this and it can just skip forward that many bytes in the buffer and not care about them. And it can interleave frames, put them in their own buffers, and restitch them back on the other side. This is the most fundamental piece of information about H2. This is what allows it to overcome the latency problems by interleaving binary data frames on the wire. The only downside to it being binary is that we can no longer inspect HTTP requests or responses on the wire. So you, you getting used to being able, in your dev tools to be able to see the text of the raw response, unfortunately, that is going. But there are some ways to get around that I'll explain later. So here we can see how closely it maps from a H1 request to H2. So we'll have the header area in HTTP 1. That probably will make up a couple of header frames. And then the payload, which will couple, probably make up a couple of data frames. So all communication is now performed on a single TCP connection. And this is why it's so, um, so much improvement over latency. And here we can see the frames interleaved with each other different streams on the single connections. Whilst this is going on, I can send header frames requests for stream 6 and stream 5 whilst I'm still getting data for streams 2, stream 3, stream 4. Um, this is true bi-directional multiplexing happening right here. This animation is also extremely long. Sorry. <laughs> Let's just wait for it to go. Cool. So. Over the years, because of the inefficiencies of H1, browsers have had to overcome and create um, their own optimizations of how they optimize the requests that they send whilst they're rendering a page. And they do this by um, resource prior critical resource prioritization. Most browsers will have this baked into them. And so as your browser parses the HTML document, it will find the resources. And when it finds the resources, it's going to push these into a queue, essentially, before it actually sends them off on the network. Now, most browsers are clever enough that even if they found image one first before they found main.css in the ordering of the source, they'll prioritize the CSS file higher, because they know they need that to be able to paint to the screen. So actually, what they're doing here is they're creating artificial latency 
that they're purposefully delaying the request, even though they sent it. And I kept on going on about how latency is so important, and they're actually, on purpose, creating prioritization here. Now, with H2, because it doesn't matter the order that we send them in and it's on a single connection, I can just fire off the request as I find them, which is amazing. So we've already reduced that artificial latency that resource prioritization incurs. But the eagle-eyed in the audience will, will see, though, OK, but what if I did still send image one first? Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get image one back first as well? Um, and so, so obviously, it's faster. But this is where H2 uh, dependency tree weighting and prioritization comes in. And this is actually part of the specification. So now, as the browser is finding those files, it will apply a weighting number, which starts off with 16 its base 64, and then it can increment that. And so here we can see that main.css has got the highest weight. And inside main.css, when we got it back, we found um, icon.css. And so you, you, even if this is passing, like we've only got half of it, we can tell via our dependency tree that this is linked to this. So you, you shouldn't send me any frames for that until I've got all the frames for that. And what's even more clever about this is that it's truly dynamic. So if you imagine that we have a tab for Google.com open and there's a H2 connection for that, the user opens another tab for Google.com and focuses on that tab. Firstly, the great thing about H2 is we can, we can share the same connection. But suddenly, all the resources for that tab become much more important than the ones that still might be on the wire here. So in real time, we can change the stream weighting via frames and tell the server, actually, now these ones have become much more important. Another use case you could imagine, even on your website, a user hovers over a button. They click on the button. That opens up a carousel. And the carousel is a big hero image. Suddenly, that hero image, its priority becomes much more important than any other data. And we can communicate to this to the server via prioritization. This is extremely, extremely important. No longer do we have to try and trick the browser and hide resources from the pre-parser, because we can actually get the, the browser to do this work for us. Um, in introducing HTTP 1.1, so 0 0.9 didn't have it, it allowed us um, to start adding metadata to our requests and responses um, via headers. And we started to have a wealth of metadata. And because HTTP is stateless, there is no state maintained, unfortunately, we have to send this data, especially things like cookies, on every single request, even if the server's already seen that cookie. And this is exactly how login systems authentication works on, on, most log on most websites. And so I have to always send this cookie. And so to address this in the H2 specification, they invented HPAC, which is uh, a compression algorithm specifically designed for um, HTTP. Now, there could be a whole talk just about HPAC, because it's really, really intelligent. But I'll just uh, explain to you basically how the basics work. So the first thing is that the client and the server maintain a static lookup table, so just like a database table, on either side of the connection, on the client and the server. And in the specification, there is um, detailed the most commonly occurring key value pairings for headers. And they are assigned a, a, an ID number. And so whenever you need to send that value, you actually don't need to send the key or the value at all. You just send the ID, because the server will know exactly that. But the really intelligent bit is for, for the duration of that H2 connection, for that single connection, both the client and the server maintain a dynamic lookup table. So the first time I send this cookie header, on the, on the server, it will be assigned a key of 64. The next time I want to send that same thing, I only need to send the key of 64 uh, along with those, because the server's already seen this. Now, the problem here is this is actually maintaining state between a client and a server. And that's why things like CDNs have had quite a lot of uh, trouble implementing H2. And then uh, to send a new one, I just send that, and it will get assigned that. And then all of this data is then Huffman encoded, which is the same algorithm, that, um, the compression algorithm that GZIP uses to reduce that footprint even more. It's incredibly, incredibly intelligent. Um, please, if you're interested into that kind of thing, go and check out the HPAC spec. And finally, before moving on, the final feature I wanted to discuss about H2 is server-side resource pushing. As we saw earlier, I have to send a HTML request, my GET request, my index file, wait for the server to process that. I then get that back. I start parsing the document. I find the CSS file, and then I send a request for that. Now, 
that's extremely inefficient because I've had to wait for the server to process that, even though as application designers and developers, we know that the next thing that the browser is going to request because of resource prioritization is main.css. And I always know that when index.html is request, the next thing they're going to request is that. So what if we could intelligently tell the client that? So with H2, I make that request. Whilst I'm processing that maybe that dynamic file, I can push the, the resource, the data for that main.css file even before the client's even got any of the index file and before it would normally parse and find it. So we've dramatically reduced the latency that it might take for that normal round trip. Now, the eagle eyed in the audience would notice that the push promise frame, so this is a new frame type, just like the header and data frame, the push promise frame must be spent, uh, sent as part of the specification before any data frame of the initial resource. And why is this? Because you might get into a race condition, that if I had sent the data frame first, the, the client might be so fast that it would then find the CSS file, and then you're actually sending more of the bytes, too many bytes as possible. So as part of the spec, push promise frame must be sent first before any data frames with that file. Now, the even more keen in the audience would have noticed that what if the client already had that main.css file in its cache? So we now have a new frame type called reset stream. So this is the client saying, no, OK, thanks for that. I don't need any of the data frames for that stream because I already have it in my cache. So that's even more efficient. And we can use reset stream quite a lot if, say, for instance, the cache headers are already um, still not, they're not stale, then you could reset may, may, maybe AJAX requests during the connection's lifetime. And this is incredibly powerful. I can't stress that so much. This is truly bi-directional multiplexing of H2 connections uh, in full effect right here. So we've learnt um, the building blocks of H2, which are um, streams and frames and binary data, uh, data framing, resource prioritization, header compression via HPAC, and server-side resource pushing. Now, hopefully that wasn't too much information for you to take in, and that, I, I promise you that was the, 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 the most techy, crazy bit of it all, of the, this talk. But the more I, I've, what I personally feel about this, that the more I've learnt whilst working with H2 and reading the spec, the more I've become to be amazed by its design. And it, it is truly incredible compared to H1, and they've done some amazing work here. And I've only literally just skimmed the surface. Um, it's a very large specification, but it, I do um, urge you to go and, and have a check and read it a bit more. But hopefully I've given you enough there to take home and apply um, to your day-to-day -day work. So the most positive thing I'm going to show you today is the current browser support landscape. Um, we've got a global average of 70, and here in the UK, we've actually got 77, which is amazing. Safari finally jumped on the bandwagon at nine, and that brought up the stats massively. And this, is, this alone was enough for us at the FT to know that this, it was worthwhile investing in. Um, out of interest, who here is using, has deployed H2 into production? One person, great, and two, awesome. Um, that, that's good to see, but um, you know, that's hopefully why I'm here to try and um, trying to, to get you all to on the bandwagon. Um, a much debated issue feature of H2 was um, its uh, requirement for TLS, that you have to um, ser be serving a website over HTTPS. And probably that might be a reason why most of you in the audience aren't using it yet. And the original Speedy specification, it actually was a requirement, but they dropped that in the HBS working group. Um, and it no longer is. But and so it's got, they've got a lot of stick for that. And, I actually agree with them. One, because I think we should be making the world a more secure place. But two, in um, the speedy experiments, they found that many of the old middle boxes and proxies, so the, inter the internet's actually made up of lots of cables and boxes in, that get eaten by sharks under the ground, uh, under the sea. And if those proxies didn't understand the packets that they were routing, they would drop them. So in the speedy experiments, they saw between 10 and 15 packet loss for all connections. And that's why they enforce TLS, is by creating a secure tunnel, you're ensuring that there are no middle boxes can be inspecting the packets. Who here has heard of Let's Encrypt? Awesome. That's great. And so you have no reason for your site not to be delivered over HTTPS now, where there is a free open uh, certificate authority that makes it so easy for issuing and reassigning certs. Ilya, it would be really good if you get someone to come and talk about Let's Encrypt, because um, I think more people need to know about it. So once you've got TLS set up, um, you, you start observing your own traffic. 
this when we started our HCU, um, it's obviously gone up a lot more, was what our stats were like. I, we started to talk to our stakeholders, explaining the benefits of HTTPS and H2 and what might happen to those other users. Um, the server support is looking really good. Most of you probably serve your websites using Nginx or Apache. They both support it now. This is actually about to change. I need to update that. Jetty, if you're using Java, Win IIS for Windows, the support is all there for the actual servers. Um, sadly, the CDN landscape's not looking that great, but it's getting better. Akamai supports it. Uh, Cloudflare, um, no, no sign from AWS CloudFront yet. Fastly have done it. They've actually got the best implementation at the moment, and I'm not being paid to say that, even though I am a customer. Um, they, it's just that they've chosen the best H2 server, something called H2O. Uh, Akamai's just about to release push. But I heard we all like to deploy our software in the cloud these days. Um, um, don't know why it rains a lot up there. Oh, that was a terrible joke. Um, but um, the service providers, uh, their internal networking stats are very bad. Google App Engine are the only people that have native support for it. AWS have not mentioned anything on their ELBs yet um, because Heroku is on AWS. We're not going to see anything there anytime soon, I don't think. Um, so that's great. You've upgraded your server software, maybe. For some of you, that's as simple as that. How can I start using this? Um, the approach that we first took at the FT is to, it's probably easier. You probably already serve your static assets, your images, or your CSS of something else other than your application server. So why not just put a CDN or a proxy in front of those? And you don't need to worry about that, because that's going to probably take a lot longer to upgrade your origin. Or um, Stick a proxy in front of your origin that can speak H2. This is, I know a lot of businesses have going for this approach. This is, in fact, how Fastly did it as part of their CDN work. And then finally, hopefully in a couple of years, we can just, so everything, all of our servers will be speaking it natively. So once you're H2 capable, um, it's time to start considering how you're going to optimize your resources um, on what you want to push. So here's your typical um, critical rendering path. We have to request the HTML file. We then parse it. We get the CSS. We have to block waiting for that. Then we get our fonts. We have to block waiting for that. So obviously, to me, the most important things should, that you should be pushing are your critical resources. And look already the impact that has on the timeline, the amount of latency that we can be reducing. There's been a lot of debate within the W3C of how, as developers, we declare the resources that we want to push. Um, so the most common way of doing this now is via the link header and using the rel preload attribute. So this is me saying that style.css, I want you to push this. And Apache, Nginx, and H2O have all taken this as their implementation of pushing resources. Um, you can also do that via an element, but that's probably far too late. The client would have already found that. So you should do it as a header. Um, myself and people like Yoav Weiss, actually, um, who he, he wrote preload, uh, think that actually we need our own semantics because the semantics of preload are slightly different to what you want to push. Um, so we're pushing for a, a rel push specification. Um, so now you've, you've got it working. You want to start seeing if it's actually doing what it's want. Uh, the web page test, which is the toolbox of most performance um, engineers, uh, now has native support for it. You can see multiplex connections within the connection view. You can also, for the Firefox agents on web page test, you can see pushed resources. Um, it took me about three months to realize that in Chrome, you have to right click and enable the protocol in the network panel. Literally took me three months, and that's the only way in Chrome that you can tell whether or not a connection is. So here you can see us serving our document over H1 and all the resources over H2. Firefox put it where I would have thought it would have been, in the network connection, in the headers. And I mentioned earlier, because it's binary, fr uh, binary framing, we, can't, we can no longer inspect the actual um, response body. And so unfortunately, we're going to have to start becoming more friends with tools like Wireshark's as front-end developers. And I, this is quite scary when I say this to a lot of people. I, I was as well. This is a really good blog post explaining how to set up Wireshark properly and use the um, TLS encryption. But this is great. Here you can see header frames on the wire and actually the data of that. So it's decrypted the binary and the TLS certificate, and I, now I can actually see the data. So the only way to do that in DevTools at the moment is in Chrome. They have in Chrome Net internals, you can actually inspect the open H2 session and hear the headers. And it needs a lot of work, especially as more people are going to start to having to use Net internals. Um, they, it needs so much love. Um, 
And if you've implemented H2 and you want to know how much of the specification your server or CDN is living up to it, there's a really good um, test suite H2 spec on GitHub that you can run against your deployment and see whether or not how, how good and how much of the spec you've implemented so far. Um, sorry for the whirlwind tour at the end there. I've already uh, run over time. I told Ilya I'd only be 30 minutes. I'm already 35. Um, so hopefully in that section, you've learned the browser support, the TLS requirements, considerations when you're thinking about choosing a H2 server, what you should be pushing, how you can push it, and the current tooling landscape around it. So to end with, I just um, whilst HTTP here is here, a lot of you aren't using it yet, but there's already some problems with it that I think that people are starting to iron out. And it's only by us trying and feeding back to the working group and to the uh, browser vendors will this become better. And so um, one of the biggest problems that you might have noticed with push is that there's, it still can be extremely efficient that I'm sending resources down to the browser, even though it might actually already be in the browser's cache. So. Um, what is his name? I've forgotten. It's yeah, yeah. Kenji, who wrote H2O um, Server, has come up with the Cache Digest specification, and this is going to be a new frame type. And this is a way of the client communicating to the server what resources it ha already has in the cache for that host name, and that's extremely powerful. Not just for H2. Think about how CDNs can use this. It's amazing. So it basically um, uses an algorithm to compress down all of those values into a single digest and sends that up in a single frame on the H2 connection. It's very powerful. And I talked a lot about head of line blocking earlier. And whilst we've eliminated head of line blocking, we've only done that at the, at the request layer. Actually, all we've done is push down the inefficiencies to the TCP layer. Um, and so a lot of um, deployments, especially um, friends of mine at Fastly, actually don't like H2 because all they've done is pushed the problem lower down the stack. And so Google uh, thought of already realized this many years ago and have moved on. And they have now opened the specification for Quick, which is H2 on top of a UDP connection, not a TCP connection. So it, when you're browsing on Google.com today and many of the Google properties, you're already not using Speedy or H2. You'll be on a Quick connection. And um, it took four years, as I, sh as I said, showed at the history line at the beginning, for H2 to become so. Um, I'll probably be back in about four or five years to talk about Quick and uh, why it's so great. Um, so ultimately, it's new. There's a lot of answered question, unanswered questions. When should we start de-optimizing assets? What's best to push? How is this going to play with service workers? And how does it affect my website? And to leave on that note, I just wanted to share some of the findings that we've had um, at the FT. And I think by only us talking and people sharing and people writing blog posts do, does the web evolve. So we ran a split test when we first deployed HTTP2. And um, we, so on mobile, tablet, desktop, and compared the 95th percentile of the page load event. And you'll see that actually it doesn't have that much of an impact on desktop, but it has a dramatic impact on mobile by nearly five seconds. And I think this is amazing because it proves that it truly was designed to battle latency. And that is the problem that we have on mobile. We don't have latency problems on desktop. So then we measured the round trip time, so the time it takes for all of these average connections. And you can see that the uh, the greater the round trip time, the better the um, impact H2 had on the overall uh, load event, and H1 got slower and slower and slower. And finally, um, this is actually where desktop did. We've, we've started some experiments with push, and you can see here that we shaved uh, 1,000 milliseconds of our start render by pushing um, CSS files. And I've been working in performance quite a long time now, and I've never had a single technique that's been able to cut that amount of time off. So it's, it's incredible. Um, go and use it. Um, uh, come and chat to me afterwards. I'm so sorry I've gone over. Um, thank you very much. Oh, God, there's more. Um, <laughs> The performance basics still matter, right? A slow website on H1 is still going to be a slow we website on H2. You need to think about the performance basics. Optimize your first render, compress, minify, optimize, reduce DNS lookups, use CDNs to reduce your latency, and come to London WebPurse. We host it at the FT. I'm a host. Sorry, I had to plug that. Um, if you want to find out more about performance techni techniques, come to that. Thank you very much. That's the end. The slides can be there.